obviously an honor for me to be here and uh, be one of the 11 people who want to say a few words to congratulate Pear and maybe say a few things about the future of computing. And this has been a tough one to do because uh, we only have 20 minutes and they said use the first five minutes to pick on Pear, the last five minutes for questions, that gives you 10 minutes. But then the Greek goes and he talks on and on and on, so I don't know how much of, I don't know how much of the 10 minutes are still left for me, but we'll see. Uh, what I want to do today is uh, first we celebrate, we remember, which will become clear in a moment, and then I have a slide to pick on pear because I'm sure all of us have a slide to pick on pear. And then a little bit about some old paradigms with uh, new instances of those old paradigms with a couple of comments about what we need to do moving forward uh, because there are problems about these new instances of the old paradigms that need to be solved. And then uh, a couple of words about what I think is the future as to what the microprocessor is going to look like. The question is, did I start before you were born? I don't remember. <laughs> but it's, it's, so I got my PhD uh, 52 years ago, 1966. <laughs> At the age of uh, minus 17, by the way, since I'm 35 years old now. I'm 35 now, I got my PhD 52 years ago, means I was minus 17, which is the youngest PhD to graduate from that <laughs> university. Okay, so first we remember, so Burton Smith passed away uh, on uh, April 2nd, and I cannot let the conference go without uh, paying uh, my respects and making everybody who's not aware of it aware that Burton uh, died. Uh, Burton was born in 1945, uh, and he passed away on April 2nd. He was an incredible computer architect. He was even a more incredible human being for any of you that uh, have known him. Uh, he did several machines. His first was the HEP, which uh, introduced um, multi-threading, although he said he got the idea from the control data 6600. Most of us give the credit for multi-threading to, uh, to Burton. It was not the simultaneous multi-threading you hear talked about today. It was in order, one instruction at a time, but the concept of not requiring branch prediction because every cycle you're fetching from another thread and so you don't have to fetch the target of a branch until after that thread goes through the entire pipeline. Uh, he did the HEP at Denelcor. He actually, which is not known to many people and I probably shouldn't even mention it, but uh, he actually came up with SMT in his planning for the HEP3 except that the HEP, the Nelco went out of business before the HEP3 was ever announced, and so it didn't, uh, SMT didn't happen for another 15 years. Then he went to the U.S. government, uh, did Horizon, and then from there moved to Seattle and did Terra, and then was uh, absorbed by Cray, and until his death he was working on a quantum accelerator. Now I poked a lot of fun at quantum computing because you know, there's never going to be a quantum computer. That's silly, a quantum computer. Can you think of a quantum computer fetching and decoding instructions? I don't think so. But a quantum accelerator, that's a different story. In fact, accelerators is the answer for the future anyway. And Burton was working on a quantum accelerator uh, as a technical fellow at uh, Microsoft. He won the Eckerd Markley Award, the Seymour Cray Award. He was a member of the National Academy of Engineering in the U.S. More importantly... He was the most incredible ethical human being, humble human being, always celebrated the work of others. He was a mentor to graduate students of many, of, uh, many faculty members. Uh, in my case, he was a mentor to Steve Melvin, one of my HBS students, to um, Francis Tseng, and, to, uh, and last year to Stephen Pruitt. And he's been a mentor to me over the last uh, 35 years that I've known him. So I wanted to do that first. We're celebrating Pear. We should also remember Burton. Okay, Pear. So uh, we met in Quizo, 1994. Uh, thanks to Daniel Itez, uh, another beautiful human being who passed away too, too soon, had gotten money from the French government to invite 
uh, 50 PhD students in computer architecture to this ugly old castle in Quizo, which is outside of Toulouse. And he invited several of us to come, and each one of us lectured for a day. Uh, the hotel rooms were terrible. Uh, no radio, no TV, no nothing. The light bulb was 20 watts. You couldn't even read in the room. So the only thing you could do in the room was sleep. So what we would end up doing, in fact, Per and I would sit out in the courtyard until 2 o'clock in the morning discussing and arguing and being told, go to bed, you know, by people who <laughs> felt we were being too loud. The food was bad. The wine was worse. The worst wine, I, I can't believe it, this is France we're talking about, you know, and it was the worst wine that I've ever had. Um, uh, but great conversation in the courtyard until very late. Uh, Pierre is supposed to be an expert in parallel stuff, but he could never explain to me oh. sequential <laughs> <laughs> True or not true? He is supposed to be expert in textbook writing, but he needed Michelle and Morley in order to get the book done. <laughs> and finally, he is supposed to be a Viking, <laughs> but his boat comes equipped with a little motor in the back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some very old paradigms. Proximate computing, machine learning, quantum computing, Old, if you understand the context. We've been doing approximate computing for years. We used to call it floating point. You know? Machine learning, it's just an outgrowth of what was done. When I was a graduate student, but I was part of the Adeline project, uh, Professor Widrow. At the same time at Cornell, uh, Frank Rosenblatt was doing the perceptron. At the same time in Germany, in Karlsruhe, uh, Steinbuch was doing the learning matrix. So machine learning is not a new uh, thing. And quantum computing, as I already pointed out, is just an example of accelerators. Approximate computing, too much silliness. You know, JPG, everybody knows that if you have a picture with all these pixels and you kill 40, 50 percent of them, you can still recognize what the picture is. So using so celebrating approximate computing because you can recognize an image with half of the things, you know, done wrong, you know, is no big deal. In fact, there was a, a paper published in uh, ISCA a couple years ago where they were doing approximate computing in the iCache, which I really don't get at all. You know, you take an opcode that says add and you change one of the bits and it becomes subtract. And so I don't know, are they mathematically sophisticated? They understand that add, add and subtract really are not the same thing? Yeah. So where it could be useful, I think, and I'd like to see some good work being done. So Mateo's group has done some uh, uh, initial stuff in it, and I'd like to see more. You take a parallel algorithm, some of the threads need to be done Exactly, but a lot of the threads don't. So if we could figure out ahead of time how to break the parallel algorithm into threads that you need exact and threads that you can tolerate uh, approximate, you could probably get the, uh, the task done a lot faster. That's where I'd like to see the work. In, in my opinion, it's the algorithm people that need to uh, lead that effort. Uh, quantum computing, I've already told you, it's an accelerator. The critical issue there is interconnect. You know, the GPU has understood that for years. You know, how do you go to memory, and do you have a special memory, or do you have multiple ports, CPU to memory and GPU to memory? Uh, interconnect. Uh, a long time ago, I consulted to uh, Digital Equipment Corporation during the VAX days, and when they introduced the VAX, there was no vector processor. And then they need a vector processor. You know, Mateo, you always need a vector processor, right? Yeah. But the way they did the vector processor made it a disaster because of the interconnect. So anytime you do an accelerator, the critical issue moving forward is how do you do the interconnect? Because if you screw up the interconnect, this powerful thing that could help you achieve greater performance gets lost in the noise because of all the time it takes to interact uh, with it. And then finally, machine learning. 
I would like somebody, uh, somebody, I'd like us to spend more time. So machine learning, how many people are using machine learning and they're completely clueless as to why they're getting the right answer? And they're not always getting the right answer. As you know, the uh, Uber car that uh, ran over this woman and the, uh, the uh, other car that went into the back of uh, the truck and killed the guy. Uh, understanding the training better, which we don't, is going to make a big statement as to how to avoid catastrophes in the future. And I'd like to see more people working on how does the training happen and how do we prevent these points in this huge dimensional space which gives the outcome that you train it one way, but then when you put it into the inference engine, uh, it becomes, uh, you end up with a catastrophe. The inference engine is the easy part. It's the training engine that we need to be spending a lot more time on. And while we're at it, we need to clean up our mess. I just heard that yesterday there's another meltdown problem with uh, an arm, I think I heard, is, the, is where the meltdown problem is. Uh, and it has to do with speculative execution, which we're the ones that pushed. And uh, now we've created something that we need to spend some time on. Uh, the future, the end of Moore's Law presents challenges. We'll have to think smarter. We'll have to bring to the table everyone working on the transformation hierarchy um, to uh, help solve the problems. My slide. In fact, you have to send me your slide. Pear has a better version of this slide. This slide I came up with 35 years ago, and it indicated the fact that each one of us works at a layer of my transformation hierarchy. So some people describe problems in natural language. Other people design circuits to provide a voltage difference for the electrons to go from here to here. In fact, it's really the electrons that are solving the problem, not the, the English or Swedish or whatever uh, language that the uh, problem statement is done in. And back when I made up this slide, it was to indicate that we're all working at our layer, and what we need to understand is the layer below, because we're using the layer below to build our layer, and we have to understand the layer above, because we're building the, la we're building the layer from the, la from the, the, um, the raw material of the layer below in order to solve or to contribute to the layer above that needs to work on us. But now we're reaching an era where what we really need to do is understand all the layers because in order to get performance moving forward, the algorithm people really need to know more than just about the program, but they need to about, know about the microarchitecture. A good example, um, predicated execution was a good example of the compiler people and the microarchitects uh, getting together, for example. And I would argue that it's across the spectrum. When Pear talks about my, uh, these uh, layers of transformation, he has this bolt that, go, that dr drives through all of them, indicating that the layers really need to... Uh, talk to each other. Transformation hierarchy, much more than just the software, it's the hardware underneath as well. Useful in moving forward because of accelerators, which I believe is the engine that takes care of the uh, domain specific task, and the von Neumann CPU, which will provide the order to allow those tax tasks to be taken uh, care of. Uh, the von Neumann CPU is like the conductor of an orchestra, keeping track of all the instruments working properly together. It's a straightforward model of executing programs. Many have suggested that its day is over, no longer interesting. We've gone on to these non-von Neumann stuff. I would argue the non-von Neumann stuff is just accelerators. It by itself is just the boring thing that is fetching and decoding and doing the different things and then passing the data to the accelerator that's going to churn to produce the benefit that we need. And accelerators, they be, uh, the, the red at the bottom is what's important, requires the attention of everybody on that transformation hierarchy. The person writing the algorithm, the programmer who programs the code, the compiler that turns that code into the code that the ISA will accept, and then the microarchitect that provides the stuff 
that the ISA is going to, uh, that the ISA requires to compute the result. Uh, doing this is going to affect education. We'll need to bring to the table all those working at all levels of the transformation hierarchy. That's a whole lecture in itself. So I'm not going to indulge myself other than to point out to be effective tomorrow, graduates will need to understand both hardware and software. They'll need to understand all the layers of the transformation hier hierarchy that's necessary moving forward in the age of uh, computers. Uh, John Hennessy had a panel at uh, this touring 50th anniversary thing a year ago uh, promoting this idea as well. I've called it my motivated bottom-up approach, that you, you, when you start teaching, you teach to motivate, but then when you really go into it, you go into it at the bottom and you keep on raising the level of abstraction <laughs> until you get to the point where you've motivated. And that carries you through these layers of transformation. And I'm done. Thank you.